healthcare business podcast from the Coker Group that focuses on solutions to help healthcare organizations effectively navigate the changing healthcare industry landscape. All right, well, welcome back to the podcast. And today we're actually continuing a discussion that we've had going on now for literally a, a, a few weeks, going on a couple of months now even. And we're continuing the conversation around post-COVID predictions and observations. And of course, there's, you know, there's so much speculation right now. We're still in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so we're, we're not by any means through it, but we, we believe, Coker believes that we absolutely need to, we being the industry, the marketplace, need to be thinking about and, and starting to prepare for what is coming down the pipe for when we do get into kind of a post-COVID world. And there's, again, plenty to speculate on there. And there's a lot of different facets to that. One of the things we have been talking about is specifically when it comes to affiliations and alignment transactions. And, and here we're talking about alignment transactions as it relates to physician groups with hospitals, as well as physician groups with private equity. And quite frankly, it could be physician group mergers and acquisitions as well. So um, just generally speaking, kind of post COVID alignment uh, observations, we, we had a, a uh, first podcast a couple weeks ago where a few of us from Coker teed up the discussion and that laid out uh, a number of the points that we've been thinking about, looking at, observing. Uh, We released a white paper back in May, I believe. We covered the the topic from a pretty uh, broad perspective. Also, um, my guest today um, is Amy Greeter, and she's one of our senior vice presidents, and she spends a lot of her time and has spent a lot of her time over the years on working on alignment transactions, as well as things related to leadership and strategy for our hospital and physician practice clients. And Amy's actually written a series specifically covering some of the things she talked about in the last podcast, which go into much more detail in her three-part series on leadership through a crisis. And so I encourage everybody listening to this to go and and check those out on the Coker website as uh, they're very informative. And and so with that, Amy, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks, Mark. I always enjoy being here. Thanks for having me. We, we love having you. And and we'll jump right in because, as I mentioned in the intro here, we are um, continuing this conversation. I, and I want us to kind of pick up a little bit of where we left off. Maybe we can drill into a little bit more detail. But one of the things I, I think we, we started to talk about before and certainly warrants further discussion is thinking about leaders, um, whether you're management of a group or a hospital or, you know, you're someone advising those types of organizations or your private equity looking to uh, do partnerships and, and form affiliations with those types of entities. As leaders, generally speaking, and we're looking at alignment opportunities, knowing there could be uneasiness going forward. There's a lot of uncertainty, volatility, and we're going to keep feeling this out. How do we as leaders kind of approach this uneasiness as it relates to alignment? Maybe talk about that for a minute. Sure, absolutely. So I have had the blessing of having, you know, a decade, decade and a half of experience working on these alignment transactions. And what I can tell you is that the fervor associated with transactional activity during March and April of 2020 has been unprecedented. The reality is that many Hospitals, many physician practices have been in a situation in which they have seen a massive degradation in their volume. So the Commonwealth Fund has released some research that showed that in April of 2020, when things, at least at that time, were, we thought, reaching their apex of, you know, pandemic proportions. Of course, now we realize that that was just the start of what was to come. But in April, we realized a significant degradation in volume. Ophthalmology practices were down 75% from the previous month. Otolaryngology practices were off more than 70 percent. Dermatologists were down more than 70 percent. I mean, that that comparison to baseline visit volume is unprecedented. People, A, didn't feel safe coming to the doctor or doctors weren't available for cases. Surgery centers weren't open. Hospitals weren't having elective cases. 
And so we saw this huge change in both clinical visit volume, but also in financial performance. As we all know, if the cases aren't there, if they're not being done, there isn't any money coming in the door to these healthcare systems. I think what's interesting is that coupled with that decline in volume has been some economic analyses that's been published by the American Hospital Association. And so the AHA's estimates are that for the four months that we just wrapped up from March until June of 2020, America's hospitals and health systems are going to be seeing something close to $203 billion in losses. We're talking about $51 billion in loss per month. And so what you see is this massive confluence of issues. There aren't physician practices that are having visits come in. They're not making any money. And yet hospitals aren't getting any money because there aren't surgeries being performed there. There's not cases coming in. So what happens? What do we as leaders do when we're hurting and we need help? Or we're hurting and are supposed to be the ones to do the helping. And we're not in a position to do that. I think it's an awful question that so many of our health system clients have had to face, which is what if we don't have the money to take on physicians right now, either strategically or just to help support them? You know, what do we do then? What does our leadership scheme look like when we just don't have it? And for practices, what do you do when you have no other options, when debt financing is not going to be had in a situation like we had, you know, 60 days and 90 days ago, when there wasn't free flowing cash? You know, people weren't going to take a risk on investing in a venture that may, you know, frankly, go belly up. And so what happens? And so we gave advice to our clients that really was three parts. Number one is acknowledge the awkward, which means if you need help, if you're a medical practice that needs help, or if you're a health system that can't provide the level of transactional support that you would want to have right now, acknowledge it. Be forthcoming about what the reality is. It's not going to do anyone any good when you're in a situation like we have just been, and we will continue to be in for several months, if not longer, to just beat around the bush. They acknowledge it. This is where you're at. This is where you need help or you can't get the help and put it out the forefront. Number two, a second piece of advice is to focus on what you can control. So if you were a medical practice and you are not able to get the revenue stream in, you need to look at cutting some of your expenses. And that is a difficult decision. That means in many cases, layoffs, people that have been with you and supported you for years, if not decades. But you have to focus on what you can do to keep your boat floating. I mean, that means bailing water. That means bailing water, even when it's tough to do that. For hospitals or health systems, focusing on what you control may be giving some level of assistance, but not going into a full, for example, employment transaction, taking on an an acquisition of assets, taking on acquisition of real estates, employing physicians. You just may not be able to do that. So focus instead on how you can support either through an infusion of dollars or through a payment for services rendered, some of which are abnormal in the time of COVID and could warrant additional payment, but focus on the things that you can do. And then the third set set of advice that we've had is to be overly communicative. And Mark, I appreciate the uh, shameless plug for my crisis leadership series. But in one of those articles, we really talk about the importance of communication. It's couched in the guise of what Steve Jobs does with Pixar, but I think is directly applicable to here. It's the fact that you cannot over communicate during a crisis. It's just there is no shortage of communication that can occur. And so here, when we're talking about transactional work, again, it's not so much of the yes, I, I can or yes, I can't acknowledging the awkward, as we talked about, but it's talking about the limitations of what you can do and when you can do it by. This may not be a 90-day transaction turnaround like we've seen where you can, you know, pretty expeditiously turn things around. Certainly, systems are able to do that in crisis situations, but it may not be that they have the dollars available to do that. So, communicating about those realities is exceptionally important during these times. Yeah, I think those are great points. I think even just 
generally towards leadership and and they certainly apply towards leadership in a crisis scenario but they absolutely apply here to thinking about how these deals uh, perhaps could get done and, and perhaps will get done. And, and so taking those principles, I, I think we could acknowledge deals are going to happen and deals are going to need to happen um, as, as we continue, hopefully, to emerge out of this, but also as we just continue to navigate it. And I think right now and, and in the future, in the near future, certainly, we could acknowledge that the, the why, quote unquote, behind some of these deals may change. I, I could imagine some are going to happen b- based on strategy, whereas some others may happen based purely on need. And, and I'm sure there's kind of some, some probably combinations of those as well. But maybe talk about that a little bit, because there is some differentiation between those, as I understand it. Absolutely. And Mark, you're exactly right. I mean, some of the deals that we've seen happen in the recent past have been truly out of need, like you said. So, for example, an orthopedic practice that doesn't have any elective cases and is otherwise going to go under, you need to rescue, not only because they provide a valuable clinical service to a community, but because a hospital does a good margin on orthopedic cases you know, you need them to contribute to the bottom line. Now, that's not always the case. As Mark said, some of these deals are just born out of strategy. I think what's important to realize is that going forward, there may be less of these that happen out of true need and more that we can start to shift out of what is the strategy. And the reality is that many health systems are going to have a different strategy in the latter months of 2020 and in 2021 than they may have had at the start of 2020. And so how do you figure out what deals really meet your strategic plans going forward? And I think one of the key considerations is that you differentiate between what you want and who you are. And what I mean by that is that it's easy to have a march up the hill mentality and say, this is what we want. You know, we want this deal to get done because this is what we need as a system or what we want to accomplish as a system. Those deals feel very transactional. It becomes very, very apparent that we need X group to be able to achieve Y end. And make no, you know, no uh, small claims about this. Even the best actors out there in their role as hospital administrators become apparent at some point in the deal making process that, that you're a means to an end. And I think that's always hard when you start out a relationship from a this is what I'm getting from you. I think instead, the important thing is to think about who we are as an organization and what you help us do. So, for example, if our values are about providing the best service to our community and to our patients, then you are a great potential partner as opposed to target, right? And the what we want strategy. But you're a good partner because you help us best serve the patients that we serve. And I think during times of crisis, like we have been in, and then going forward, just as a long play, this is the most preferable approach to alignment transactions. It's how do we partner and achieve something great, as opposed to how do I use you to get what I want? And I think if we can really rally around some central point, especially when they focus on patients, that's always the best possible scenario. Most physicians that I work with didn't go into medical school and then into practice to be able to make a zillion dollars. I mean, I think that altruism and a desire to meet the needs of patients is still at the very core of who physicians are as caregivers and people. And so rallying around that message, I think, is a much better place to start than, you know, what are you going to do for me lately and how are you going to help me get to where I need to be? Yeah, I think that's a great way to look at it, because as I try to think about it and putting myself in the different the shoes of the different parties and something like this, if, if I'm a, a part of hospital leadership, you know, I, I think I can truly approach this as as the, uh, propose it as a partnership, because for all those things that have made you great and have made you a, a target that is 
of value to our organization, we want to continue that. We just want to do that together. We can allow that. And and then from the practices perspective, whether it's the the partners, the position partners, or the CEO and administrator, executive committees. I don't think by any means they have to look at this as any sort of capitulation or giving in to pressure or anything and are joining the other side. And we've said that for years because, you know, oftentimes, particularly in cases of need, you know, that sometimes it's kind of acquiescing to that need. Whereas I don't think that has to be the case. here. I think all those things that made you great, made your group great, can continue. And you can continue to enjoy them and benefit from them. Um, you're doing it with a partner now and, and, and there should be benefit in doing that for you and, and your partners and, uh, and the collective. So it's, it's, you know, it's a little bit of this kind of blue sky scenario if we can achieve it. But I think in order to get there, it's not always easy by any means, but there's kind of a simplicity to that approach that I like. Absolutely. And I don't think that there should be any reason to think that transactions shouldn't continue to occur. I mean, that's never what we're saying. There's value to be had in these partnerships, particularly when it strikes a mutually beneficial end for both parties. I think transactional activity should absolutely continue. And in fact, even in the prime, you know, of COVID or what we thought was the prime, we have continued to see strategic affiliations and possible affiliations being pursued. I mean, one of the ones that strikes home for me just because of where I'm located is the new Hanover transaction that's being contemplated. So last summer, the new Hanover Board of Commissioners based in New Hanover, North Carolina, looked for a potential cell or partnership for New Hanover Regional. It's a medical center. And in January of this year, they went ahead and submitted a request for proposals. And so right as this was due, March 16th, they still got six different organizations that submitted proposals to be that strategic partner to New Hanover. They were, you know, Atrium, Bon Secours, Duke, HCA, Novant, UNC, some of the pretty major players, both here in North Carolina and I would say within, you know, the Southeast. And so when the board at New Hope, New Hanover looked at it and started vetting the proposals, they decided to go forward with naming some finalists. And so in early May, they narrowed it down to three finalists, Novant, Duke, and Atrium. And they said, we continue to want to look for an affiliate partner. And if nothing else, in, in the midst of all of this, we think that having a partnership will only strengthen the services that we can provide to our community. And so because it's a public institution, all of the proposals are publicly available. You can go out and find them with a, a simple Google search. But we know that people were continuing to put forward best and final offers of serious economic value. I'll, I'll pick on no one, but they have pledged and even continued to remain committed to in this post-COVID era, you know, five billion dollars, two billion of which would be an upfront cash, two and a half billion that would be for the strategic master plan and furthering the vision there. And then, you know, 500 to 600 million dollars in capital. And so while the selection hasn't been finalized, even as this time as we're recording this, I think it's very indicative of the fact that these affiliations are going to continue and systems are going to continue to place a priority in their stretch dollars right now to look at partnerships. So whether you're a medical group, whether you're a standalone hospital, whether you're part of a system, I think you can continue to look for a lot of transactional activity, both during this this COVID pandemic, however long it ends up taking, and afterwards, certainly. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And we're going to continue to see cases like that. And I think that that's a great example, certainly a very large scale, too, um, which the numbers alone are, are now as we're recording this in July, almost kind of staggering to think of. But I think even scaling that down to a number of smaller deals that will continue along those lines, I think those commitments, you'll see more commitments like that. And you'll see these different parties coming together and realizing, okay, yeah, there, there's not only opportunity, but there's benefit, whether you call it strength in numbers or or just kind of partnering and resilience or whatever the the, the term you want to use. 
I, I have to think uh, that's only going to continue to increase. One of the things I know that we've talked about is, or that, that we've written about in some of our, our pieces on this is it's hard to, to talk in any case, in any scenario about some of these alignment transactions without considering what the reg, how the regulatory component is going to play out in all this. And, you know, I'll, I'll do a quick plug for um, some of our other team members here at Coker covering this from a standpoint of regulatory scrutiny, whether it relates to physician compensation commitments and terms, as well as the impact on valuations as we continue to kind of navigate through COVID and post-COVID and what the impacts of those are going to be. Maybe just briefly, Amy, if you just want to kind of generally comment some of your observations as it relates to the regulatory scrutiny and what that may look like or, or some things we can do to prepare for that, thinking about transactions now in the future, what that regulatory scrutiny may may look like. Absolutely. So I think we have seen a lot of national legislation with respect to payment reform, or at least temporary payment reform during the time of COVID, right? We've seen a lot more things that are now able to be reimbursed than we ever had before. And again, there's a lot of pressure, I think, on parties that be to keep those temporary payments to be final permanent legislation. I think what's interesting, though, is that we're starting to see a surge in state-specific regulation around these transactions. So while the national landscape hasn't made any overarching new legislation about transactional activity, we are starting to see that on a state level. I know just in May, we saw California Senate Bill SB 77 distributed to the California Senate Health Committee. And what SB 77 did, as it was originally written, is it would subject all acquisitions and affiliations and transactional activities that start at the end of this year or the first of the new year to to be intervened potentially by the California Attorney General. So that means if you're a large health system or you're a hedge fund or a private equity fund and you want to acquire or otherwise partner or affiliate with a hospital, a health system, physician, an ambulatory surgery center, or a lab, you're going to need prior approval by the California AG. And so that means that the AG would be able to withhold approval from these proposed transactions unless it really met the greater good. And that's defined as it increases you know, clinical integration, similar to legislation we've seen about clinically integrated networks, um, and, or that it would increase access for the people that need it most. So healthcare services to the underserved, underinsured, uninsured, or other things that would result in anti-competitive behavior. And that's just not going to be allowed. I think it is noteworthy in terms of the scope of discretion that the AG gets to have, meaning, you know, if there's a public hearing on a transaction and he gets a lot of, he or she at the time, gets a lot of negative feedback, this is going to be really important decisions that they alone are going to be able to make based on the feedback received and their interpretation of the value of the transaction. And we've seen other states that have these proposals in place. We saw it in Connecticut. We saw it in Washington state. But I will tell you that the California legislation is the most encompassing. It goes the furthest in terms of having this prior approval requirement for these transactions. So while we continue to think that transactions are going to take place, as you said, Mark, it's not going to be without regulatory scrutiny. And while these states certainly have legislation you know, under consideration, I have got to believe that this is going to continue in particularly some of the more progressive states where you know, people are going to follow suit. Yeah. Well, I think what's interesting there, too, is is the, the point there that other states, like you mentioned, Connecticut and Washington state, but I know a number of others out there have some sort of prior approval um, requirements. Many of them typically, as I understand them in the past, it, are more related to antitrust and um, things like that, where it's 
kind of a different perspective or a different angle that the, that the uh, authorities and regulatory bodies would be looking at as far as is this does this pass muster, you know. But now when you think about the the burden of of making a case based on increasing access or availability of services or in, increasing clinical integration and, you know, more efficiency into the delivery process, things like that. It's not like those cases can't be made, but they're just additional cases that have to be made in order for this to happen. On top of just generally or, or at a basic level, I guess, the the logistics and the time frame, the additional um, filings and approvals that you're going to have to go through and the paperwork and the lawyers that get involved and, and other people, you know, I, I think that's going to be something for consideration. So back to your earlier comment about, you know, a 90 day turnaround in, in some of these places and some in different cases, different scenarios may not be as realistic. And, you know, some of these things may get kind of, you know, they start to drag out a little bit. Um, but hopefully, hopefully things like that in California won't deter, you know, different organizations from going after or pursuing these types of partnerships. Uh, yes, some, some of them may not happen. Um, but frankly, you know, I think, uh, proving some of this information, outlining it, identifying it, uh, acknowledging it on the onset in general could be a good idea anyway, because it's kind of factors into that whole, the strategy behind a deal to begin with. So, um, didn't necessarily have to be a negative thing, but absolutely agree that there's, I think we can expect more regulatory scrutiny and, and maybe even some additional hurdles that we hadn't had to face in the past. In addition to what you've said, we often think of our attorney friends as being helpful in antitrust cases. So there's plenty of great antitrust attorneys that we work with. But I somewhat jokingly say, is this going to be a new segment of business? You know, have I just come across the, the million dollar idea here, which is that there are going to be attorneys or consultants that are focused on not antitrust, but on, you know, pro value determinations. Is this going to be something where health systems aren't going to have a dedicated resource to be able to support the level of proof that's needed for an AG, for example. And so is this really this new business venture that's going to become possible where people are going to look for outside resources to be able to substantiate, you know, the value of their transactions so that it can go forward. And, uh, you know, I don't know if I can put dibs on that idea, but I'm certainly going to say it here for this uh, podcast to viewership to say, hey, you know, this is my great idea. If you need help, certainly we can provide you with some services here because I think it's very clear and we've had to, in other cases, uh, support the value of a transaction. And that may be, you know, ever more valuable to really get a deal done to pass regulatory scrutiny now. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. I, I've been saying for years that there were so many transactions that occurred going back to the mid 2000s, even uh, late 2000s, that were I'll just say, you know, fly by the seat of our pants type approach. Honestly, it, it, it just seemed it was a gut feeling. It seemed like a good idea. Probably did make sense. I mean, I think everybody probably in many of these cases, everybody kind of understood what the strategy was. But still, in so many cases, they didn't really dig into articulating that, documenting that strategy and and kind of uh, playing it out on on paper and then in application. And, you know, things like this. We can look at them as additional burdens or obstacles or whatever. I, I think we could also take the angle of potential opportunities. And I think this is an opportunity. I completely agree with you to to show value, to to make a case that says, yeah, it's not only whether it's need or strategy based, regardless, you know, if there's value to be had from this, it's, it is important for the communities these organizations serve and the patients that these clinicians um, reach and, and touch on a daily basis, that, that applies to all this criteria and any other, I think, criteria that they, they may come up with in the future. So I, I really do think it could be an opportunity for, for those organizations to get ahead of some of these things. I agree. And I, it makes me think of the community health needs assessments that you see posted on all the not-for-profit system websites. And obviously, Mark, you and I have a pretty intimate knowledge since Cooper has a whole service line that does that. 
But is there going to need to be something like the CHNA that accompanies, you know, your proposal for an acquisition going forward that really substantiates the value? And it's just something interesting to think about. You know, that may be what it takes to get some of these transactions going forward. Yeah, and, and I think uh, that's absolutely a great example, and and it ties back to other things like, um, as I referenced a, a minute ago, with thinking about compensation packages. It, it's it's not uncommon for health systems to go into a transaction with kind of maybe it's their standard comp package that they've done in the past, or it's just something that they feel comfortable with. A certain model makes sense, and they haven't had issues with it in the past, so this makes sense to do it now. But you know, going into a transaction like this, regardless of how large or small, could be a great opportunity to take a step back and say, is this the right package? Is this the right model? Is this the optimal scenario? Um, or could we kind of use this as a launch pad to something better or new or more effective? Uh, valuations as well. Right? And, and I think this is going to play into the different transaction structures and the actual affiliation models that are pursued. Because uh, if if you don't have the financial wherewithal to go all in on an employment model, like you referenced earlier, where it's cash up front, it's uh, assets, it's real estate, et cetera, then you know, what other alternatives are out there? And, and there are others. We've been doing those long before COVID came around. I think we'll continue to, to see those and navigate through some of those uh, different dynamics, I guess, in different scenarios um, long after COVID fade. So I, I, I completely agree. Yeah, I, I would say just a couple of closing remarks to summarize my thoughts. I think that transactional activity is not going to slow as a result of COVID. In fact, we've seen a massive spike, you know, in the early months when it came to fruition here in America in that March, April, May timeframe. And I think as it continues to wear on, we're going to continue to see more transactional activity. And I think even when people start to get their feet really firmly on the ground underneath them, we're going to find that there may be some inefficiencies that need to be rectified. And so we're going to see more transactional activity. I think we're going to see it, as you alluded to, Mark, across all sectors. We're going to see it in hospital to physician. We're going to see it in hospital to investor. We're going to see it in physician to investor and physician to physician. So really, I think the bar is high in terms of how many and which sectors we're going to see this. And I think we're going to have to get over the fact that there may be some more hurdles to get through, whether it's through the valuations that are going to have to have some normalized analyses as a result of the decline in volume that we've seen or some of the fall off in terms of profitability. But and then certainly the regulatory scrutiny that we talked about. So there may be more hurdles in terms of getting transactions done. But I think they'll continue unabated. It just may be a little bit more complex, but they're out there and they are definitely going to be done going forward. Certainly, you know, we, me, I'll say, would love to be part of any of that activity, whether it's in free transaction due diligence, whether it's in negotiations, whether it's in, you know, optimization or implementation after the fact. Um, But certainly a lot of work to be done in this new normal that we're going to be in. Well, I think you said it well, and uh, I think those are great points. And and I just, again, I know I've referenced this, but I really encourage everyone to go back, listen to our previous episode on this topic where we, where we teed up some of this. We'll continue to talk about this. We also have the white paper that goes into a little bit more uh, detail on some of these different things we've discussed. And, uh, and then Amy's series on leadership in crisis. And then also stay tuned for some additional um, content related to valuations and compensation in a post-COVID environment. And uh, and we'll continue to talk about it and, and cover it because this is something, obviously, it's front of mind, I think, in one way or another for uh, everyone out there uh, as far as the healthcare marketplace goes. And this is it's not going away anytime soon. So we're, we're, we'll continue the discussion. And Amy, I really appreciate all your points and, and uh, we're continuing the discussion discussion here in the future. Sounds great, Mark. Thanks for having me. We hope you enjoyed that episode of Coffee with Coker, and we thank you for listening. We want to encourage all of our listeners to participate and contribute in the podcast. Uh, So if you have any questions uh, on any of the things we discussed in this episode, any of the topics that were presented, please feel free to ask us. Also, we welcome your feedback and suggestions. If you have any ideas 
uh, related to the, the material we discussed in this episode or again or in any episode please let us know and we'll make sure to incorporate it and if you have ideas for topics you'd like to hear more information about in future episodes please send those suggestions to us we'd love to hear them and we'd love to incorporate them into our future episodes uh, you can find us online and on social media start with our website and specifically the podcast is coffeewithcoker.com you can also find that through the main coker website at cokergroup.com you can also find us on social media twitter at coker group and then on linkedin you can search for coker group and find our page and and the page for uh, some of our team members as well there so you can find us and reach out to us a number of places and then if you want to contact us directly one of the best ways to do that email feedback at cokergroup.com that's feedback at cokergroup.com and again we'd love to get your feedback and we'd love to encourage everyone to subscribe to the podcast so that you can be notified when future episodes are released Uh, we look forward to uh, the next episode and we look forward to getting your suggestions and feedback on this episode thanks for listening and we look forward to speaking with you again on future episodes